Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today and your patience. Uh, what would be a virtual event without some uh, hiccups in the background. Um, we figured it out though, so thank you for being here today. My name is Kayla Young. I am the COO at Phase, and am here to introduce the event. Um, we also had a little bit of switch up. Usually we do our fireside chat first, um, but due to said technical difficulties, we're gonna do our panel first. So um, today we'll have an awesome fireside chat with Ivan and Greg from the NCI and a panel discussion that will be centered around building successful startups and bringing novel and impactful innovations to the oncology market. For both the fireside chat and the panel, there's time set apart for questions. So please use the chat box on the right side of your page and get those questions um, uh, coming. And we will select uh, winners for prizes as well from those that ask questions. Um, so at this point, I would like to introduce the moderator of our panel, uh, Malika Ashford. Malika covers personalized medicine and um, treatments for cancer and molecular diagnostics for Genome Web and Precision Oncology News. Um, she will be introducing the rest of our esteemed panel. And again, I just wanna thank everyone for being here today and uh, please ask questions as the event goes on. So with that, I pass it over to our panel. Hi everyone, um, as Kayla said, uh, my name is uh, Malika Ashford. Um, I uh, am a reporter and an editor for genomeweb.com and Precision Oncology News. Um, and uh, I wanna thank Kayla and Ivan for inviting me to do this. Um, I think we have a great panel, um, including uh, Emmanuel Akpuraye, who is the founder and CEO of Veyana Therapeutics. Um, Lindsay uh, Pino, co-founder and CTO at Talus Bio, and Trevor Levin, who is founder and CEO of Convergent Genomics. And uh, what I think is interesting about this group <laughs> is that it really illustrates how complex the precision oncology space is, um, the diversity of activities and opportunities and unmet needs. Uh, so I'm excited to hear from you all about some of the commonalities and the differences that you've all experienced setting out to commercialize drugs, diagnostics, uh, discovery platforms. Um, and I just wanna say, it seems you know, to a certain extent like oncology uh, is relatively an easy target for startups compared maybe to some other areas of biotech. You know, There's a built-in rationale, uh, this desire or potential to improve patients' health and outcomes, but not every scientific discovery needs to be or maybe should be a commercial product. Uh, so I'm curious what each of your experiences were kind of coming to the realiz realization, you know, this needs to be a startup um, and then figuring out how to set out to do that. Um, how did it happen for you? How should other folks maybe be thinking about that, determining if this thing that they're excited about has a real path forward? Um, so Lindsay, maybe uh, you can start by introducing yourself, your company and, and kind of digging into that question a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question to start off. And yeah, welcome everyone um, to the Genome Startup Day. I'm Lindsay Pino. I'm the CTO and the co-founder uh, of a company called Talus Bio. Uh, we're focused on developing small molecule therapeutics uh, for transcription factor proteins. So proteins in the nucleus uh, that are turning genes on and off and in cancer, especially um, doing this at inappropriate times um, leading to the, the oncogenic event. Um, and for us, Talis, uh, we kind of spun out of my co-founder and I's academic career, uh, where we had published a study. We invented this method to study transcription factors, just an easier, faster uh, way of measuring transcription factors. The paper came out um, in uh, 2020, and there was all this inbound interest, just cold interest. People emailing, pharmaceutical companies emailing, saying, wow, this is really cool. Like, we'd love to send you some samples. Uh, and it just kind of got to the point where it was clear that there was a market need, like there was interest in this kind of method. Um, so co-founder and I um, started using different resources that were available to us um, at the University of Washington. We're based here in Seattle um, and kind of built up uh, this company. So for for us, it was all this un inbound interest that convinced us this is there's definitely a need. Um, Emmanuel, what about you? You're in a pretty different space here with basically a single drug candidate that you you know you believed needed to be advanced. So can you tell us about yourself and and Viana and how you kind of took that leap? 
Well, first of all, um, thank you to the organizers, uh, Kayla and um, Ivan, bringing this together, and also for the participating audience. So, so my name is Emmanuel Akporaye. I'm the founder and CEO of Vienna Therapeutics. And I come in from the academic background. Um, I was in the university setting at medical school, Tucson, University of Arizona in Tucson for about um, 17 years. And um, I'm you know, really a tumor immunologist. And I happen to be working on ways to improve uh, the immune response in, in cancer, focusing on breast cancer, and specifically triple negative breast cancer and um, or two breast cancer. And uh, the journey was a long journey because um, it took a while to get there as, um, of course, you have to do a lot of proof of concept studies, get NIH grants and show that it works. And uh, in fact, uh, the drug we're working with is um, a drug that is, uh, targets tumor cell mitochondria uh, that leads to apoptosis and eventually can also secondarily stimulate the immune system. And as my wife will say, you know, when it, whatever this drug touches, it works. So of course, we do a lot of work with different cell lines and some other colleagues, you know, had done some work on, on these agents. And, you know, we kept saying, this is working, this is working. And um, as a full professor, tenure professor, I took a risk. I said, I wanted to take this to the clinic. And um, I believe that my wife is still forgiving me for making that decision, but I wanted to take it to the clinic. And um, I decided to look for a location where the infrastructure was there to do so. And that was Providence Cancer Center in Portland. It's a small, nimble cancer center with regulatory people, nurses, and um, you know, physicians that are oncologists. And in fact, my next door neighbor, you know, that sh uh, championed the initial trial, you know, when I say next door neighbor, his office was next to mine. Is a clinician, and basically, we that's how we got started. So we did a phase one trial, a basket trial, showed the drug was safe, and then we're now doing a phase one B trial at UW, actually at Fred Hutch, combining our drug with. Um, um, Herceptin, which is used for, you know, treating breast cancer. So that's how I got here. I believe passion, believe, you know, so patient cool. to get here. <laughs> so. yeah. um, Trevor, you're, you're on the diagnostic side of this. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're working with? I think um, you had already decided at some point that your desired path, you know, was kind of entrepreneurial. So was it just about waiting for the right target to come along? Yeah. So Convergent uh, spun out of Oregon Health Science University in 2015. And our mission at Convergent were urine liquid biopsy for diagnosis and monitoring of urologic cancers. And within urologic cancers, you know, the, the ability to diagnose this disease, fortunately for many of those people who, who have this, uh, one of these three cancers, this would be kidney cancer, prostate cancer, or bladder cancer, Frequently, these diseases are diagnosed at early stage, uh, some 70 to 80 percent of the time, but in the other cases, they're later stage. And that diagnosis is very invasive. Um, you're looking at things like transrectal biopsies for prostate cancer, where you know biopsied sequentially, oftentimes over and over again. Uh, for a diagnosis of bladder cancer, it's transurethral scoping. And so these, these keep people away, <laughs> of course. You know, you might have blood in your urine and uh, you don't want to go through that process. Um, but also, you know, at the same time, once you're treated uh, for an early stage cancer, the risk of recurrence is very real. So for someone, for example, with bladder cancer, 60 to 70% of these patients will have their cancer come back after five years. So significant unmet need. We need better... Uh, diagnostic tools to diagnose the disease. We need targeted treatments uh, to better prevent things like disease recurrence. Uh, so I saw a significant unmet need there. Um, I started you know, in a academic setting as well uh, at Oregon Health Science University and working with an inventor, uh, kind of serial inventor, Dr. Joe Gray, who had invented fluorescence in C2 hybridization and at that time, things were really exciting at uh, OHSU as the Cancer Institute was growing. Business development teams were being built uh, into the Cancer Center. Uh, there were opportunities to look at interesting technologies, identify things that could be spun out of the university. So that was really one of the goals when, when I started working there. And then, 
you know, it's, it's not just enough to have an interesting technology. You know, you have to build the right team. Uh, you have to find the funding uh, for this effort. And uh, those are things they don't necessarily teach you in academia. So that's, I think, some of the fun things that all of us likely share uh, as we've been building these companies up. Yeah, that's a great segue. So, I mean, imagine, you know, you've got your thing. You've been lucky enough to find a way to start the process, you know, how do you then scale up? The three of you seem like you faced and will continue to face really different challenges. I mean, Lindsay, you know, for a drug discovery platform, I imagine a big hurdle is deciding whether to basically become your own pharmaceutical company <laughs> or to try to attract outside partners, you know, from that world. Um, how has that been going for you guys? Yeah, for sure. We're, we don't have any kind of like revenue to sustain us. So we need funding to get some of that data, like, Emmanuel was talking about, right? Like you need proof of concept. You need to have all this information before you can even go into clinical trials. Um, so how are you going to get the money to do that uh, as a startup company? Um, so for, for us, we ended up doing venture capital um, and we went out and raised uh, rounds of venture capital. Um, that's dilutive funding, right? So like you're selling off pieces of your company, um, control of your company, of the vision of where you want to take it. Um, which is scary. And then we started learning more about these opportunities through the NIH um, and these small business grants um, that can help you get that proof of concept work done without taking on all of that dilution and losing control of your vision for what you want to do. Um, so we've been exploring all of these <laughs> kind of different options because it's it's hard. It requires so much money up front um, to get started. You know, I, I think a lot of people are familiar with the academic model where you apply for a professor job, you ask for a startup package, you know, a million dollars or something to start up your academic lab. Like, okay, well then the university gives you a million dollars and you start writing grants. How do you get that first million to open a lab of your own? Mm -hmm. um, for us, the answer was venture capital. And I think, um, you know, when we were talking last time, you mentioned, you know, if we, if it had been a couple of years ago and we weren't in this pandemic, you know, you guys might have ended up having to uh, pack up and move, you know, to where all the the, the drug makers are. Um, but, you know, in this context, you were able to stay put. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We, we incorporated and kind of started uh, the company in 2020, mid 2020, um, opened the lab in early 2021 and drug drug discovery, drug development happens really in two places, right? Um, the first is in Cambridge in Boston and the other is in San Francisco. Um, but my co-founder and I felt really strongly about the biotech scene that's here in Seattle. We wanted to stay in Seattle where the technology was born and where we know that there's a lot of talent. Um, and the pandemic kind of gave us that opportunity, right? Because a lot of those, those big uh, hubs, um, everything was virtual anyway. So you didn't have to be in Cambridge. You didn't have to be in San Francisco. And I think some of that is going to continue now too, right? Like everything's reopening there's a lot more meetings happening in person, but I think still there's a lot of these opportunities where a venture capital firm would be more than happy to take a meeting virtually um, instead of, you know, you have to go down to their office and knock on their door kind of a thing. So I think that's a great opportunity um, for people who are maybe thinking about it, but maybe don't want to uproot <laughs> and, and move to one of these, these other cities. Yeah. Uh, um, Emmanuel, you know, what, can you tell me a little bit more about kind of the environment, um, you know, at the, at the Providence system and like what that's been doing for you as you've been going through these steps of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, get, kind of girding yourself for the long uncertain process of uh, inhuman clinical trials. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I was particularly lucky. And uh, when I left Arizona, I came to Providence and I ran a lab there on immunotherapy, you know, as the chief of that laboratory for five years. And when I came to Providence, I brought, I had the assets, license, you know, sub license to Providence to do a non-exclusive clinical trial. So Providence then, they believed in the agents and they marshaled all the money. In fact, um, they paid for the original uh, manufacture of the drug. Uh, I think I forgot to mention that this is an oral drug mm -hmm. that you can take. So the API, which is the part that was manufactured by them, they made the capsules, they paid for the IND enabling studies in mice and non-rodents, and they also deployed a clinical trial. So from the, for, a very, for a very small startup, we were very lucky that way because it was a basket trial of about 17 patients. 
and they did the trial. And, you know, it was a safe drug. Uh, it was stable disease. We didn't get clinical response. And um, so that's how we got started. So without that support initially, there's no way we'll have started this journey, you know, to the point where we are now. The other thing that's very relevant too is that, um, you know, we think about, you know, friends, family, and fools when you start, that we just give you money out for the best. Then they go to angel investors and they've gotten smarter now. They want, they will, they will ask you, well, do you have NIH grant? You know, has your proof of concept been uh, validated? So that's also important to do. And also starting a company coming from, you know, a, an academic background, no concept of business, I had none. You know, so, you know, don't use, um, what's it called, it, to, to set up a company, get a real lawyer or law firm that we do that for you. And that's where the NIH funding is helpful because 7% of a small business grant can be targeted mm. to business things. So that's, I would recommend do that. You know, once you get that going, then it gets a lot easier to attract uh, more funding. But the road is it's never easy. You have to just keep plugging, plugging along because uh, there are more no's than the yeses. So. And Trevor, I mean, you know, you don't, uh, you don't necessarily just kind of burst out of a research lab knowing how to get, you know, CLIA certification or how to scale up, you know, consumables manufacturing for diagnostic tests. So, you know, what are the next main steps for you in kind of establishing this and 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 bringing it to the clinical market? Yeah, so we we are uh, commercially available with the product today through a CLIA lab, uh, as you mentioned, and this is. Um, a, an interesting business model. I mean, if you really want to get to business and providing a service a little bit faster, I, we had very interesting drug candidates um, as well uh, within Joe Gray's group at OHSU. But I, I saw that, you know, a, a billion dollars of investment to get an average drug uh, across the line felt like quite a significant hurdle to me when I was doing an entrepreneurial research fellowship, you know, uh, at a university. But I felt like in a diagnostic, this is maybe a tractable problem where I had a, a sure or more sure odds getting a product across the line and helping patients quickly. Um, so that that was one of the reasons that we chose this journey. And so now we're a team of 40 people, um, you know, hiring and building a team is critically important um, uh, when you're building a startup. And always aiming to hire somebody who has more specific domain experience than you do. Uh, always looking, I should be the lucky one that I got in on the ground floor and that everybody else who comes after has significantly more experience. That's kind of how I approached that. The other way to approach that, I knew I had to build a network. And I, I, to start a company, while I felt like I had a good network at the university, it wasn't nearly large enough. So for us, going into a business accelerator and uh, meeting all of these people at Illumina. So we did Illumina Accelerator. And you're there for six months in their labs, meeting leading researchers uh, within Illumina, but then also they're constantly bringing VCs and investors through, meeting all of these people. You got to kiss a lot of toads, right? Uh, to find those right partners, to find the right people that you really want to build this company with. So that's uh, that's been part of the journey for us. Just yeah, that sounds really formative. Um, so maybe just one more question for everybody: um, If you were, you know, starting over from scratch, uh, anything that you would differently? Um, kind of looking back, who wants to jump in, Emmanuel? Um, starting from scratch, um, you have to believe in what you're doing because. Um, there are many disappointments along the way. And also setting up your company the right way is very, very important. When we started, we went, we did legal, legal Zoom, which didn't do much for us. And also to be very careful when you, you know, get attorneys, you know, that can get you set up uh, correctly. And also realize that, you know, 100% of nothing is nothing. So the fear of saying, oh, I don't want to be deluded, you know, for me, it's not that important as much as getting a drug, you know, to be commercialized for patients. So it's a win-win for everybody, you know. So that's what I will say to keep in mind. Gotcha. Lindsay, any advice? Anything, yes. anything you would switch around? 
for me personally, I think something I would do differently is just go all in from the start. So maybe maybe this is related um, to what Emmanuel was saying, but for a while I kind of had one foot still in academia, finishing a postdoc, and I had another foot kind of in the company. Um, I wish I had just gone all in from the start instead of kind of slow playing these both and not really being able to do a good job at either of them, right? Um, I wish I had just gone all in on the company and just gone full commitment as hard as I could from the start. Um, that's something I would do different from a personal standpoint, yeah. We've got um, an audience question, which is um, someone's interested in hearing more, you know, specifically about uh, your experiences with talent recruitment, you know. Um, I, you know, Trevor, you talked about, about that a bit, that you guys have, have grown, you've got a real group. Um, Lindsay, you know, what was that like for you? And where are you guys uh, kind of standing at that point? I will say starting in a pandemic, hiring was very tough, um, mm -hmm. especially as a startup, like it's all about the people that you have, especially when you have so few. Um, so we are still currently under 10. Um, so every single person has a huge influence on mm -hmm. The, the company, the, the culture, the direction, the missions, the values. Um, so we definitely spend a lot of time. Every single person meets with every single candidate and we take everyone's feedback into account. And for a long time, it was really dry. <laughs> like the, like just everyone was kind of maybe hunkering down, staying at their current positions because we were in a pandemic. Um, but we have recently in the past few months had a lot of uh, really great talent come in and I think maybe part of that is people <laughs> realizing at their old job like oh I'm not maybe as tethered to my old job as I thought or they're all going you know more inflexible like I have to be in my seat every single day for every single hour versus as a small startup you can be a little bit more flexible with work from home and other benefits so we struggled for a long time we've recently had a huge wave of excellent talent um but yeah it takes a long time it's worth spending the time and getting the right people especially from the start Emmanuel, I know that you're still a really uh, a kind of a lean operation there. Yes. What's, the, what's the inflection point, you know, that you're kind of looking at in the future where you're going to have to bring more people in? Well, the inflection point is now. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I'm the only full-time employee in the company. So, I mean, Trevor and Lindsay, they're way ahead of me. And um, I've, I can do everything. I think quite well, but not as an expert, you know, from drug manufacturer to clinical trial to monitor and all that stuff. So most of the people I've worked with are consultants that are paid, you know, on, on you know, on work done. So we're now trying to do a series A race to bring in, you know, talent, you know, people that are full-time employees. And we expect that uh, that race, if successful, can bring in about you know 20 people in that you know when the company as the company grows so that's that's where we are okay well that's a that's a, a good place to be it's an exciting place to be maybe a scary place to be um so good luck with that and good luck to both you Lindsay, and trevor as well um really interesting stuff going on in all three of these projects and i'm excited to see you know where, where it all goes thank you Malika. thank you for the opportunity Thank you, everyone, for um, your <laughs> flexibility today, A, um, and B, as well as uh, those insights on this panel. Uh, we really appreciate being able to talk to all of you, and thank you again for participating. Um, so at this time, we're going to transition to our fireside chat, um, and I would like to introduce um, Ivan, who will take it from here and be talking with Greg Evans from the NCI um, about grant funding as well as other um, other routes to grant funding. So with that, I will hand it over to Ivan if you want to turn your video on. Well, hello. Why, thank you for having me. This is the part we normally do in the front. Does it work if it's in the middle? Uh, my name is Ivan Liashko. I uh, am one of the founders of Phase Genomics. If you guys uh, are familiar with this event, we know that sort of the goal of this uh, is to bring not just sort of existing founders and existing folks who already know what to do, but really to show you sort of like the human part of what it's like to spin a company out, um, especially from academia. Most of us, you know, have roots in ac academics. And so, you know, as you just heard from the panel, um, you know, one of the things that 
constantly weighs on a founder's mind is funding, right? In some cases, you can you can get money from selling stuff, right? But if you're making like a diagnostic or a new drug, you can't make any money until after it's done. And so you constantly have to find funding. And one of the uh, amazing sources of funding that the U.S. government provides for us is uh, this program called SBIR, which stands for Small Business Innovation research, I think. Um, these are grants. And as academics, we love grants. We're so used to writing grants all the time, but these are a little bit different. So um, so the goal of uh, the sort of my conversation, my fireside chat uh, this week, will be to really kind of show you guys, in case you don't know, um, how SBI sort of introduce you to the SBIR program, because we've certainly benefited uh, from it a lot. Um, and But it's not the same as the grants you're used to. And so I will be talking to someone from um, from the NCI who who leads um, SBIRs. But before we do that, um, one thing we do at uh, here at Genome Startup Day is we give away DNA socks. <sighs> and so um, and uh, and this week we even have a newest edition, green. <laughs> so. Um, my good people will give me a name of a person in the audience because I don't see any of you. I'm just talking to my own face and I'm assuming there's someone over there listening to this. Um, and I will give you a pair of socks and you can choose which color. We have so many, three. So um, today is going to be, oh, Kelly Hammock. Kelly, come on down, virtually speaking. Here's some socks for you. Uh, afterwards, we will send them to you. So congrats. And now, um, let us introduce, we're going to do this with the camera first or me talking first. So I'd like to introduce you guys to Greg Evans. <laughs> Greg. Hello. Um, oh, there you are. Okay, good. We're, we're so tight. We're so op optimized timing so much that <laughs> when my words came out, that's when you appear. Uh, <laughs> which is more efficient than I was ready for. Um, so uh, Dr. Greg Evans is uh, one of the program directors uh, or possibly the program director uh, at the NCI. He, um, he, got his, uh, he got his PhD uh, in biochemistry from UCLA. Uh, he's, yeah, as I said, program director and team leader at NCI for the SBIR program. Um, he has been a program director for a long time, uh, including um, at NH. LBI, which is another uh, one of the uh, NIH institutes, uh, and he focuses on cancer biology, e-health, epidemiology. Greg also is, uh, he is a great guy because he he does talks about grants to people. Like <laughs> he tells you how to improve your chances of win grants and uh, explains them to you and the purpose. And so um, it's very, uh, it's, it's very awesome to have you, Greg, because I think uh, our audience can Really learn a lot uh, from some of your uh, some of your information. So let me just get started with a pretty simple question that's not meant to be like very deep. But but SBIR grants, um, what's the purpose? Why does the government do this? And how are they different from normal grants? Right, we're all used to like like R ones and uh, fellowships, F thirty twos, and all that stuff. What's different about the SBIRs? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say on behalf of the National Cancer Institute's SBIR Development Center, thanks for having me today. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the biomedical uh, research community in Seattle, and I've had some great experiences there. And then um, finally, I want to thank Benjamin uh, for helping me get into the meeting. We had a bit of trouble, but uh, we're in. Uh, so uh, in response to your question, I would say... Um, you know, the Congress created the SBIR program in 1982. I think the major goal uh, uh, was to create jobs in the U.S. You know, small businesses are a wonderful uh, way to create new jobs. And we've done some of our own uh, evaluations of our SBIR program to show that's actually happening. Um, how are they different from other types of grants? Uh, how are SBIRs and STDRs different from R01s and R21s? Um, it's commercially directed work. You know, that's the obvious main difference. Um, For-profit small businesses only as far as eligible applicants. Um, you know, and I can tell you that uh, in the NCI uh, where I work, you know, we have a central office called the SBIR Development Center where all we handle are these two types of uh, grants and some contracts as well, but it's all 
SBIR and STDR, and it's all commercially directed. And because of that, um, because we have a central office and that's all we do, uh, we're very focused on uh, commercial aspects of commercialization, let's say, including many of the things that your panel mentioned, team building, uh, uh, fundraising, IP, regulatory, all those kinds of things, um, which, you know, uh, really aren't paid attention to much for academic grants, obviously, and and unfortunately, even in NIH study sections for SBIRs, they aren't uh, um, paid enough attention, I would say. And that's why we have this office, because we like to think that we pay even more attention to those things. I'll stop there. Yeah, no, no, it's great to keep, <laughs> you know, uh, don't stop if you if you have something cool. Like, so one of the things that was, it, it, to me, when I first started writing these, um, you know, I wrote my first phase one, like in 2016 or something, 2015. And, um, you know, you like learn everything because, um, you know, when you're an academic, you you write like the science part of the grant and somebody else does everything else. And all that other stuff you suddenly have to think about when it's uh, when it's your company and you're writing this grant. And so there's lots of extra sections. But one of the things that was to me um, that I found very uh, counterintuitive at first is because, you know, I used to think about uh, research, right? Research grants and proving some scientific hypothesis or trying to, you know, not necessarily prove it, but, you know, um, and the, the focus of these grants is very different because they're not, in, the intent is different. The intent is not to answer a scientific question. Right. The intent is to develop a product. And that's what I thought was very weird because I would think, well, government grants, like surely it's some kind of science thing. But you're like, no, we're making products. <laughs> Yeah, like, let me um, let, let me embellish what I said earlier and pick up what, on what you just said, Ivan. So um, it's absolutely true that, you know, with SBIRs and STTRs, the focus uh, should be around uh, taking a product. Well, first of all, around presenting a, a proposal of, of one, you know, to develop one product, bring it to the market. Uh, it has to be a, you know, very specific uh, description in the cancer world. You know, we want you to focus at least initially on one if it's a clinically directed um, product, focus on one cancer use case. So use of that means one kind of cancer. Um, and another difference I would say between SBIRs versus R1s is that um, in terms of our evaluation of the personnel involved, with SBIRs, it's more about the team than about the PI and the PI's publication record. Uh, so one thing that comes up fairly often in the SBIR world is um, you know, the, the person that you were thinking of having uh, be the PI might be a somewhat junior person who doesn't have a big publication record and a big track record in commercializing products. So, so you know, is that the right person to serve as the PI or not? So I get that question very often, fairly often. And my response uh, is usually that, um, you know, we don't need uh, a really senior person to be the PI in an SBIR world. But what we do need to have is a team that potentially across many people will bring all the needed expertise to the project. And if you don't have that expertise in the one PI or even in two people who might be working on the project at the company, then you can bring in that expertise via consultants or via subcontracts and so on. Uh, and it's relatively straightforward and easy to do that. So, um, so that's another big difference, you know, the, uh, focus on the PI with an R01 versus focus on the team with an SBIR. Um, and again, I think I've kind of said this already, but just for emphasis, we are very big in this office. Um, and we have about 10 program directors, by the way, I'm not the only one. Um, very big on having small businesses, especially new ones, be very focused in their product development efforts. One of the things I see fairly commonly uh, with small businesses applying for SBIR, which I'm not a big fan of, is that, you know, they will send in uh, three applications at once, three different product areas. Um, I mean, they might be roughly similar, but, you know, let's say three different disease areas and somewhat similar products. Um, and, and we would generally uh, take that as a negative because, um, I mean, there's just no way uh, that that the average new small business has the bandwidth to implement all three of those um, uh, uh, 
projects. Rolling and, the dice. If we submit three, exactly. anyone has a third chance, we'll get one. <laughs> exactly. And 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 that in itself, you know, means that they're probably not as focused as they should be. And you know, what I always tell advise people uh, to do when I hear about things like that is, um, you know, pick your best product that's supported by the best data and make a business decision for what you want to focus on. And then you go after it in terms of a grant until it gets funded. And then if you've got a platform that might be use, useful for multiple diseases and multiple products, you know, after you get to the first grant funded, then you can go back to the drawing board and start seeking a second one and so on. And one of the other things that I found from my interactions with the um, SBIR program officers, and this is not necessarily uh, to kind of like, it doesn't not saying anything about the other institutes and the other programs, but you guys are like super invested in having good applications that will succeed. Like, like I really always get the feeling that like when I'm talking to program officers, um, you know, we've had uh, grants from NIAD and NICHD and is that they like, they really want you to win. And so, whereas I think sometimes when you're doing kind of like the old academic grants, it's almost like a little bit of a Hunger Games where right. you're trying to like survive and you're the only one and everyone else is going to fail. Like, like I, I really get the sense that you guys actually want these things to happen and to come out. Um, yeah. So would you say that if a PI, uh, if somebody's writing a grant and they are um, kind of facing this sort of game theory, like, do I submit three in the hopes that one will win? Like, if they show you all three, and they say, look, I got three of these things. What would you suggest? Is that the right way to go about it? And you will say, like, look, dude, don't submit all three at once. That's the best one. Beef up that one. Or Well, or I mean, my, I, I, I hinted a minute ago at what my standard response is. Usually I will put that decision back on the company because it's a business decision, in my view. You know, you have to look at, um, let's say that you have three product areas and you have some data for all of them and maybe three different uh disease areas, um, you know, you should con consider, you should pick one that's your, your best um, initial candidate and, and pick it based on how much data you have on the, on the three, pick it based on the competition in the market for the three areas, uh, pick it based on the strengths of the people in your company, you know, all of those things. And so I, I'm not comfortable making that decision for a small business applicant. And I don't think I should. I think that's really has to be an internal decision. Cool. Yeah. I mean, another thing that I found interesting uh, when we first started is that the distribution of sort of team and support letters is different. Um, you know, like you, re it really helps to have someone on your team who has business experience, even if they're a consultant, even if they have no scientific background or maybe a little scientific background. Um, and also the distribution of support letters is different. Like, um, how important is it to get letters of support from, like from investors, for example, right? Like I've never thought before that we would want a, a letter of support from like an investor. Uh, that just seems so foreign to me, but this is uh, apparently yeah. very important, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, my, uh, answer to that is, um, letters are valuable for any SBIR or STTR application, number one. Number two, um, I think the, the bar is raised a little higher for a phase two application compared to a phase one. Um, and even higher, we have a phase two B that's a matching fund program, even higher for that one. Um, and so, you know, for a phase one, I think it's reasonable to have five or less letters. Phase two, maybe 10 or less. Phase two B, maybe 15 or less. What kinds of letters are they? Um, Let's start with, with uh, well, I'll just, I'll kind of lump all three of those together and just mention the types of letters. Uh, you definitely want letters from your subcontractors uh, or consultants saying, you know, we're going to work on the project. Here's what we're going to be doing. If it's a consultant, this is our hourly rate, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, fundraiser, I'm sorry, um, uh, investors or potential investors, uh, very valuable to have letters from those folks. VCs or strategic um, partners or angels even. Um, letters from key opinion leaders in the field you're working in. Uh, ideally, people not to be paid by the grant, but speaking to the, um, the value that the product you want to bring to the market will bring to patients, to the market, et cetera. Uh, those are very valuable letters. Um, and, you know, when you get to the higher dollar grants, you know, 
having several letters like that is really, really valuable. I pay a lot of attention to those letters when I evaluate uh, SBIR applications and STTRs as well. Um, what else? Have I covered all the letters? Um, How about possible customers? Yes, uh, very important. Uh, for our SBIR phase two contracts, we actually typically require such letters in the last year of a two year phase two contract. Um, so it, I guess after the first year of the contract, we require um, uh, a letter of interest, I think two letters of interest from potential customers. And then a year later, we require a couple letters from uh, from customers who are actually poised to buy the product, you know, at some at some stage. Yeah, that's one of the things when I, when people ask me for advice, I kind of go, you know, what they people really like, let's say like uh, what we're building and that we have the capacity to build it. Uh, somebody to tell you, like, we're going to provide you the samples or whatever. Right. And then also somebody on the other side would say, we if this works, we will buy it. Uh, we, and then somebody will say, if this works, we will fund it, right? So like kind of that story, which again, I'm just, I'm, I'm saying it simply because it's so different from acad ac academic grant thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, on the last example you mentioned, you know, if this works, we will fund it. So for our matching fund program, the phase 2B um, bridge program, we will get letters from investors that basically say, uh, if the NCI funds this grant based on its own independent assessment, we will invest X number of dollars to match the grant. And so, um, well, sorry, I had a thought. Um, so you meant, so there's two kind of things that you mentioned them because a lot of the audience, or at least who I think is in the audience, um, people are just starting out. A lot of them will be writing phase ones. So can you tell the difference between sort of a phase one, a phase two, and one of these fast track grants? I mean, phase two be maybe too advanced, but like. Sure, uh, sure. Um, so first of all, I want to put in a plug for if you're a first time applicant um, working on a cancer related SBIR, please, please, please talk to us in advance before you submit. Um, it's really, really valuable to do that. You, you learn how much money you can ask for, which is not always clear from the published documents. Uh, what's an appropriate project duration? We'll go through your aims with you, um, and you know we'll help you be competitive. Um, and, and and we will emphasize one thing that's really, really important, and that is, I think most people know this, um, uh, but but just for emphasis, you really need to have preliminary data, even for a phase one application, to be competitive for funding, um, and uh, uh, and that's true, even though I, the official NIH policy says no preliminary data required for a phase one SBIR. So so FYI, okay, how are the different grant types different? So. Um, I, I look at them sort of from a risk perspective. So the, you know, the phase one projects are generally the riskiest ones, the earliest stage uh, projects, but still ones, as I just said, where preliminary data is really required to get it funded. So the purpose of a phase one project is really to generate um, feasibility data to show that your product has some promise for utility in the marketplace. So you take whatever preliminary data you have when you send in the application and you build on that just to build the evidence base that your product is going to be successful in the market. So that's phase one. We will pay those at 400K for about a one year project. Uh, and then what the aims look like, you know, depends on whether it's a therapeutic medical device, um, imaging project, so on. Uh, phase twos. Um, Let's take a therapeutic example. Phase phase two SBIR grant is really meant to advance uh, a uh, new drug or biologic to an IND uh, submission by the end of phase two. You know, the average project, it doesn't progress quite that fast, but they might um, submit an IND within a year or so, a year or two of um, finishing their phase two project. Um, uh, so basically, you know, Anything that's needed to get an IND submitted uh, that's required by FDA is fair game for a phase two. Um, so we have a direct to phase two as well, where you can skip the phase one and go straight to phase two. You know, the basic requirement for that is that you've already done a phase one equivalent worth, uh, worth of work um, uh, from any funding source. Um, and um, so it's best, you know, when you come to us and ask about that, it's best just to be ready to summarize your, your phase one equivalent worth of data. 
Uh, we have a fast track where you can combine phase one and phase two in one application. The advantage of that is um, that you uh, don't have to go through a second round of peer review before the phase two. So if you get a fast track funded, then to progress from phase one to phase two, you in essence send us a progress report from phase one. We evaluate it. We also ask for an updated commercialization plan and a few other things. But if everything looks good, we quickly move you to um, phase two. So for phase twos, we will fund uh, those at 2 million. That's our maximum, two to three years time. So with fast track, you'd get 2.4 million. That's the phase one cap plus the phase two cap. Um, two, two to, let's see, now it would be like three to four years time. Uh, and then just to close it out, we have a phase two B. This is the matching fund program that I mentioned that you can only apply for if you've already had a phase two. Uh, we will even uh, accept cancer related uh, phase two predicates from other institutes at NIH or even other parts of the federal government, as long as it's cancer related. Uh, so our phase two B project uh, requires a one-to-one -one minimum match from a non-federal government source. And it'll be a three to four year project and we'll pay those at 4 million maximum. Cool. So just to reiterate, phase one is a proof of concept, 400 grand. Phase two, uh, commercialization, right? 2 million. Uh, and then possibly a phase two B, which is like a which is like a matching contract that can be multiple millions, 4 million, et cetera. Yep. Right. And so yep. those of you guys listening, you can kind of hear these aren't your $50,000 like like fellowships. Right. And that's why I think has been so powerful about this program is that it's not trivial amounts of money. It's it's ones where you can actually seed the company, right? Like a seed, a pre-seed might be 400K, right? And these are non-dilutive. And the other thing to also clarify is you guys don't claim the IP, right? Like- Correct, yeah, correct. Right? So, so we, you declare any IP that happens during, but the government doesn't take ownership of any of your- Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So it's really important that you have something that's protectable uh, because what you're supposed to do with these SBIR and STTR applications is essentially present a business proposition. There's some science too, but it's a business proposition. And so you need to have something that's um, uh, protectable. And, uh, but the government, uh, you know, these, these are grants. A grant by definition is a, is a, it's a gift. It's an assistance mechanism. Uh, and we also do contracts, but even under contracts, we are never interested in your IP. You know, we may have some so-called marching rights, but we don't use them. We're not after your IP. We are here to support the development of better products for cancer patients and hopefully to create some jobs uh, along the way. Great, yeah. Uh, in the comments, Trevor from uh, one of our previous speakers points out that the fast track, the key in the fast track is the shrinkage of the time between phase one and phase two. And so um, we've had both. We've, we've done one where we had a phase one and then later a phase two uh, off of it. And we've also had a fast track. And so um, we know that that, there's like sometimes a year gap between your phase one and a year phase two. If you don't, yeah, let, let me just emphasize though that um, you know if, if you're applying for a phase one to be successful, you need a little bit of preliminary data at a minimum. But to be successful with a fast track or direct to phase two, you need significantly more data. You need more of a story to tell. And so um, while that's absolutely true about a fast track, fast tracks are harder to get, um, and, and because you have to have a fairly mature project. What would you say? So you mentioned some common mistakes that people make, like submitting multiple grants and stuff like that. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh no, well, uh, we're here to hit, listen to you. Okay. <laughs> you tell me what you're I was uh, uh, anticipating this question, and that's an easy one actually, because the number one um, uh, mistake that I would mention that's fairly common, unfortunately, and and that I think is even. Um, more impactful in a negative way than applying for three grants with your first receipt date is not talking to us in advance. And I mentioned that, you know, you learn um, how much money you can ask for. Uh, and that's, that's probably the, the, the biggest aspect in which an initial grant submission will suffer if they don't talk to us is that they'll ask for, you know, the, the published budget in the solicitation so, so the, the budget's very complicated, but to make a long story short, there's like three different um, uh, 
uh, budget caps that are in the published uh, solicitations from different sources, Small Business Administration, Congress, and then each institute at NIH has, has sort of the highest level cap. But you actually need to talk to the people at the institute uh, to learn what those caps are. I mean, they are in the solicitations, but they're not the easiest to find. So that's one reason that you should talk to us in advance. And the other reasons I mentioned in response to one of the earlier questions, we'll go through your aims with you. We'll help you design some aims for a phase one project that'll be competitive. Uh, you know, for th cancer therapeutics, we're very, very focused on efficacy for phase one. So we will always want you to have some um, some in vivo studies in the last aim, at least at a small scale, so that by the end of phase one, we'll have some um, uh, a real sense of whether there's um, you know uh, promise based on in vivo data that that drug can be successful. Um, so yeah, not talking to us in advance. Oh, that was, I, that's perfect. That's my question. What is the number? What is the, what are the biggest mistakes? Um, and you know, like we'll be submitting a grant next week, and you and I talked about it, and uh, you gave us some super useful pointers. So I can uh, I can attest to what you're saying. Um, and also, yes, it's also true that the documentation you try to read it, you, like it, it's hard to navigate it all yourself. And one of the reasons I mentioned early on that I really like the POs. Uh, are really there to help you is that they're not, you guys are not disciplinarians. Your goal is not to knock people out. Your goal is to really help uh, clarify. So again, uh, people out listening, if you're thinking about these grants, just talk, like, talk to a PO. But that raises the question, how, do, how, how does somebody get a call with a PO? Right, so, um, uh, so I mean, to reach me, you know, I'm, I'm sort of an email guy. So just send me an email and I'll schedule something with you. It's as simple as that. Um, but, you know, the, there is this uh, misperception, unfortunately, that, um, you know, people on the outside, they think that they're bothering us by coming to us. And I will tell you that part of our job is, is to basically, you know, serve a help desk function to be available to help people uh, strategize on uh, grant submissions and, and how to be competitive. And, and again, you know, we're in the business of, uh, you know, making better products for cancer patients. And if we don't help you guys be competitive, then that's less likely to happen. Yeah, no, that, that's been one of the main kind of changes in my mind, too. I've always scared, like I used to be scared of program officers. <laughs> but actually, though, they're there to help. So, you know, we have great relationships with some of our existing ones, but sometimes there will be subsequent grants and with the same program officer and you already know them and you kind of, you have a rapport, right? So um, we're getting kind of close to time. So maybe I can ask you, Greg, um, what would be like somebody who is on the cusp, somebody who doesn't necessarily have a company yet, but they're they're right there, they're academics, they're thinking about it, maybe they will, maybe they won't, they're a little bit afraid to ask. What would you suggest they do? How would they approach? Is there something they can, is it too soon? When is too soon to talk to you? Um, yeah, so that's not too soon. You know, if I were uh, approached by a, a person in that situation at a meeting, I would say, you know, let's schedule a video call or a phone call and we'll, we'll talk through it. Um, you know, I think part of that decision, in my view, is kind of driven, if you're an academic and you're thinking about going down the entrepreneurial road, um, part of that decision is influenced, has to be, by how entrepreneurial the local academic climate is. That's highly variable, in my experience, from institution to institution. Uh, but there are lots of other things to, to you know, factor into the decision. And, and we do spend a fair amount of time uh, doing outreach just at academic places, because some well-known academic institutions, and I think there are many in the Seattle area, are very, very entrepreneurial, very pro-entrepreneurial, uh, lo lots of them in Boston as well. And so we will go to places like that, and, and we'll sit down and meet one-on-one -on -one with academics who haven't started companies yet. So yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to have those sorts of discussions. Um, I want to say to add in uh, follow one final comment and follow up to the last question. And that's the following. Um, another common misconception out there is that you should only submit an SBIR to NCI in a priority area that might be in some published list of NCI priority areas. So for NCI, SBIR and STTR, that is not so. My standard 
response to that question is the following. You know, the burden is on you as the small business to make the best case you can that you've got a product that's has a good chance of being better than competing current products. The stronger those, you know, you, just, you make a good set of arguments uh, along those lines, and we will consider your project for funding. It does not matter if it's in a recently mentioned NCI priority area. We just don't operate that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I imagine uh, to go back, the, an even better way is to have an idea and to talk to one of you guys about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you will tell me if it's in the right area or not. Right. So, yeah. Um, cool. And then in the comments, uh, uh, Kayla, uh, some, oh, Trevor pasted a uh, link to the uh, contact us where I, I imagine there's people's emails and whatnot uh, to talk to program officers. And if you guys in the audience, if you're interested, uh, email us afterwards and we'll connect you with Greg, maybe others. We're happy to help out. So, yeah. No, thank you so much, uh, Greg, for being here. Hopefully, you know, we want to spur commercialization and hopefully uh, this will help some folks. So, um, so thank you for it. coming. Thank you, Ivan. And then now Kayla is going to take over the screen and she's going to give away some more socks. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much, Ivan and Greg. Um, and thank you to everyone who participated and joined us today. Um, the final pair of socks, and again, you can choose between green, white, and black, I will email you, um, is Norm Ong. And so we will email you. Thank you for being here today, and we'll get that shipped off to you. So um, before we close, I would also like to thank all of our sponsors who make this possible. Um, this includes our industry sponsors, Agilent and Illumina, and I specifically want to call out Illumina Accelerator. If there are any of you on the cusp founders out there, um, their accelerator deadline is April 1st, so coming up quickly. Um, and I would also like to thank our alumni sponsors this year. Um, this is a cool moment for us because these are all companies that have participated over the last now three years and have now come back to sponsors. So thank you to Twin Strand Biosciences, Watchmaker Genomics, A Alpha Bio, and SQL, um, both as participants and now sponsors. So we appreciate all your support today in building our startup community and aiding us in these events. Uh, with that, we've come to a, conclu a conclusion of this event. Uh, please find us on socials. We will have follow-up blogs and videos. We will make everything available so you can get those hot tips from Greg about how to, to submit your SBIRs on Monday. So um, have a good day, everybody. Thank you for being here and keep an eye out for additional information. Bye.